I was actually here last uh, in the late 1990s before uh, Ireland had come into NATO's Partnership for Peace. And uh, I do remember I uh, had been sort of, was smuggled sort of in over the back garden wall <laughs> at, the, at the time. And uh, I think you know, probably the Irish authorities were only too glad when my plane took off uh, in the afternoon. Because, of course, at that time, Ireland's uh, uh, relationship with NATO was a very controversial uh, issue. Uh, but I hope, uh, uh, as with other things that NATO has done uh, in the 60 years of its existence, the, uh, the proof of the pudding has been in the eating uh, that Ireland has contributed to nearly all of our peace support operations in Kosovo, uh, Bosnia before, now uh, Af Afghanistan. Uh, and has been able not only to help us with all of the experience that you've gained from peacekeeping operations around the world, and the, certainly you were pioneers of the comprehensive approach, the, the notion of integrating civil military effort uh, at a time when uh, that was still uh, a strange beast in NATO. So you were certainly sort of precursors of what now has become the received wisdom. Uh, and I hope that you've also, in, in Ireland, been able to benefit from all of the training, the exercises, I saw in the press that Ireland was up in the Arctic uh, on the NATO exercise a few weeks ago, uh, uh, looking uh, up there. Uh, th th that experience has, has, has helped you as well uh, as you continue to play this very active role in world affairs, uh, being involved with nearly 600 troops in 11 different peace support operations around the world. That's a, a great record that you should be proud of. So it's great to come here today through the front door. Uh, to be warmly welcomed, uh, not to have to rush off to the airport immediately afterwards, and also to have an audience. Well, what I'd like to do um, uh, very briefly is just outline a little bit where uh, I think NATO uh, is today. Uh, this will be a mixture of NATO policy and my own personal views, because, of course, if you start talking about the future, which is dangerous, but I'm going to do it nonetheless, uh, you have to somehow give a sense of where personally you think things are going to play out. But as this is a veritable smurzgeboard of different topics, because NATO today, like all of us, is involved in so many different places, in so many different ways, with so many different configurations. Uh, it's impossible to do justice to everything that's happening at NATO headquarters without droning on like Fidel Castro or Leonid Brezhnev for uh, uh, multiple, multiple hours. I can't do that, of course. I've only got 20 minutes. So let me give you some idea of what's on the agenda. And then, of course, afterwards, in, in the discussion, zoom in on those areas that clearly are of interest to you, and I will go into much greater depth. We've just come out of the uh, Chicago summit uh, just three weeks ago. Uh, like most summits in NATO, uh, other summits too, it was very carefully scripted, carefully prepared, uh, and I think there were no particular surprises, uh, although there are big challenges uh, coming out of it we might have to face. Number one, Afghanistan. ISAF, uh, as you know, is due to end on the 31st of December uh, 2014. This is going to be a major logistic challenge. A container has to leave uh, Afghanistan every 10 minutes uh, if we are to pull all of our kit uh, out of Afghanistan safely. In fact, last week I, uh, I organised a route clearance demonstration at uh, the American training ground, Hohenfels in Germany, to test different technologies of route clearance to ensure that we can pull all of that stuff out along Afghans' roads, uh, and ra uh, to the extent exists, rail system, but mainly roads, uh, 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 without obviously uh, uh, explosions or uh, that uh, equipment being blown up. Fortunately, as you know, we've managed to negotiate with the Central Asian countries, transit, air and transit routes, to compensate for the lack of access now through Pakistan. So it's going to be a major logistical challenge. One part of that, of course, also uh, concerns the enablers. How much of the kit should we leave behind uh, so that the Afghan National Army helicopters, for instance, communications equipment, is able to function? Next thing, of course, how do we plan that drawdown? Because combat operations have to continue uh, if they're required until the 31st of December. But of course it becomes more difficult when troops are preparing for their departure. So how do we sort of phase out the NATO withdrawal that also phases in the uh, assumption of responsibility uh, of the Afghan uh, forces so that we use the time that the maximum number of NATO soldiers are still in theatre to get the maximum mentoring and training for the Afghan forces so that they're in the best possible position after 2014 to assume their own security. So it, it means, therefore, very careful planning work according to which areas uh, are handed over to the Afghan uh, forces. 
uh, and which units of NATO, particularly special forces, have to stay uh, until the end. Uh, as you know, in uh, Chicago, President Karzai announced phase three of the transition, which means that now 75% of the Afghan population will be under the nominal control of the Afghan security forces uh, by the end of this year. So that's progress. But of course, the big issue is what comes after 2014. A decision was taken in Chicago that NATO will stay. So the end of ISAF is not the end of NATO in Afghanistan. We'll stay with a training uh, mission. Uh, but of course, this has still to be uh, decided upon. Many questions. Number one, uh, how big does it have to be? I've seen figures of 20,000 uh, international soldiers remaining in Afghanistan after 2014. Uh, what do we mean by training? Does it mean essentially classrooms in Kabul, or does it mean going out into the field, accompanying Afghan uh, units? What would be the rules of engagement of the NATO troops if they are not going to be involved in combat operation? Do you need special forces uh, to stay behind to back up the Afghans uh, if uh, they have to take on major counterinsurgency or operations? What kind of, I mentioned, equipment are they going to require? How much is the mission going to cost? Uh, the figure, as you know, that the Pentagon have worked out is 4.1 billion for uh, uh, an Afghan force, of which will go down from 356 to 230,000. Uh, but how is that going to be sustained over the long run? The aim in Chicago was that within 10 years, the Afghans will assume full financing of that force. Will they be able to? How is it going to be shared around? The NATO countries, as you can quite uh, well imagine, having borne the brunt of the cost of ISAF uh, for a decade already, would dearly like other countries, China, India, Russia, the Arab countries, the Gulf countries, to assume some of that financial burden. Will it be uh, uh, feasible? Uh, those are issues uh, that we still have to decide. And of course, one big question is the partners, 22 partner countries have been with us in Afghanistan. In fact, the biggest uh, troop contributor per capita is Tonga, Australia, 10th largest uh, contributor. Uh, and uh, these partners, of course, have been intrinsic to the mission. Uh, which ones are willing to stay on? We've had, had indications from Australia, from Sweden so far, but how about the other 20? And, of course, one issue at NATO, which I think we're well aware of, is that as we start a new mission, a training mission, it's going to be very important for those partners to come forward early on and identify themselves as being willing also to stay on, but that we also at NATO engage them as much as possible uh, in consultations in the planning so that they feel as if they are fully-fledged uh, participants, you know, no taxation without representation from the word go. So we have to have basically the initial planning directive for that follow-on mission agreed in Brussels before the summer break so that with knowing what we're transitioning to, we can plan the drawdown in a way which obviously facilitates that. For example, countries need to know what they're doing. The Dutch were in a situation where they pulled out a lot of equipment uh, uh, two years ago, only then to decide that they were going to participate in the training and had to send all that equipment back, which was a, a great expense. We need to try uh, to obviously avoid that situation. Second big issue in Chicago was the, uh, the echoes of the Gates speech. I uh, used to be a speechwriter, uh, and I've spent a lot of my life giving speeches, but I envy Bob Gates, the former US Defense Secretary, because you know, in, uh, mo most of the speeches that I've given have sort of disappeared without a trace, which is probably quite, quite reasonable given the quality of my speeches. But the speech that Bob Gates gave in Brussels last summer when he uh, expressed his dissatisfaction with the European burden sharing in the alliance, and you, you recall famously said that NATO might well have a dim if not dismal future if the Europeans didn't do more. That speech has had a massive impact on, on NATO, on NATO governments. Uh, it, it's mobilized massive efforts to uh, overhaul uh, the European uh, defense contribution. And Chicago was the first sort of fruit of that effort in something that we call smart defense. We start off, frankly, from a very alarming uh, background. Uh, ten years ago, the United States spent 48% of the collective NATO budgets. That figure is now at 75%, even if it would be unfair to say that 75% of NATO is a single uh, European uh, uh, ally. Notwithstanding 20 years of the common foreign and security policy, uh, 
uh, and European defence integration. Today, 95% of European forces are nationally constituted and directed. 75% of European defence contracts are solely national uh, uh, sourced. Uh, so there's very little uh, integration uh, around uh, Europe. Uh, the European Commission calculates that at the very minimum, uh, recovering from the current financial crisis will cost an additional 1% of GDP of the EU countries for the next 20 years. This uh, produces a figure uh, uh, of about $140 billion a year, which is half of the total EU defence budget. So 50% well, of that money will be required for, uh, for, uh, to, for debt uh, uh, re repayment. And already, you know, we, we've seen around the alliance uh, dramatic defence cuts. In Libya, uh, we had uh, an aircraft carrier uh, provided by Italy, that ran out of money after two weeks, and I've never known uh, in NATO's history a, 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 a piece of kit being pulled back for financial rather than for operational or, or political uh, uh, reasons. The Europeans ran out of precision-guided munitions after eight days. Uh, uh, we had no 24-7 uh, uh, in Europe, let's say, air uh, uh, cover, uh, surveillance cover, no drones. Uh, the United States was able to provide one uh, a tanker uh, for every six fighter aircraft. The European was one for every 28 uh, uh, fighter aircraft. 90% uh, of all of the European air operations over Libya were directly, directly supported by the United States in terms of targeting, in terms of intelligence, in terms of uh, search and rescue, uh, uh, tanker support. So Gates obviously had a point. It wasn't just the grumblings uh, of someone leaving uh, office. Now, it's going to take, uh, as you can imagine, a long time to uh, rectify that, 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 that situation. And arguably, with the money that Europe spends on defence, which is still more than Russia, China and India combined, um, even if, according to the IISS in London, uh, this year we'll see for the first time more defence spending in Asia than in Europe. But still, this is still quite a packet of money that we should be able to use to increase the European uh, contribution to uh, NATO. But, but So smart defence is not just something which is important for the Europeans, but has become a kind of litmus test of the American view of the utility uh, of the alliance in the future. Um, Chicago, as I said, was a down payment. We we uh, had three major projects, all based on the pooling and sharing model. Missile defense, essentially contributed by the Americans uh, on the ground, on Aegis uh, 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 ships in the Mediterranean, but with the Europeans providing progressively 1 billion euros for the command and control architecture, the French providing satellite reconnaissance, the Germans and Dutch providing Patriot air defense aircraft, the Spanish providing the Port of Rota uh, as a base, the Dutch and the Spanish upgrading their uh, radars, etc., etc., etc. So this is an example of a of a pooling uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, second example was air policing. Uh, the Baltic states agreed to provide six million extra dollars a year to pay for the host nation support of uh, uh, the allies that send fighter aircraft to the Baltics to cover their air uh, defence, so that they don't spend on expensive supersonic aircraft. Quid pro quo, in return, is that they contribute uh, a brigade uh, to Afghanistan and invest in ground forces. Third area, allied ground surveillance, the procurement of five global hawks uh, to provide this, what we lacked in Libya, the all-weather 24-7 uh, coverage. The uh, contract for that was signed in Chicago. Uh, and again, the idea now is to base this at Signorella in Italy in a dedicated intelligence surveillance reconnaissance center which can share know-how and, and, and best practice uh, throughout the alliance. The other side of smart defense was essentially uh, uh, a, a set of so-called tier one commitments. In other words, uh, first commitments by groups of allies to pull uh, things uh, given that they are similar in size, similar in capabilities, uh, regional groupings, if you like. That, so in, in other words, instead of NATO going to nations all the time and saying, hey, you know, we've got a requirement for tanks, what can you, the Dutch, what can you, the Belgians do? This time, we allow groups of nations to come forward saying this is the status of military requirements and we can contribute that bit, you know, this bit of the jigsaw puzzle uh, because, you know, we have a capability and we're willing to invest in upgrading it. Um, so instead of the top-down approach, it's now the bottom-up uh, approach. And we got... Uh, 
uh, 20 initial projects. But I have to be, I have to be honest and, and, and say that this is only a start. Why? Well, the, f the first thing is many of the, the projects deal with sort of support capabilities, logistics, training, education, all good stuff. Uh, but rather than providing attack helicopters or a, a real hard uh, uh, capability or rationalising existing systems like spare parts for F-16s or pilot training for helicopters, then again, producing a new uh, capability. That's the first thing. The, the, the second thing, of course, is the top-down, the bottom-up approach relies largely on what people are willing to contribute which is not always what is the priority. Uh, 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 and uh, we have to make sure that all of these initially, individual initiatives m make up a coherent whole. The, the third thing is, is that we have also certain sort of more philosophical issues that we have to uh, come to uh, terms with. For example, availability. You know, if we pull uh, equipment, uh, how am I certain that uh, if a crisis comes, I'll be able to use that capability. You know, if country A has to go to its parliament and get national approval before that capability can be deployed, which is the case with some allies, Germany is, is a notable example, you know, is that compatible with uh, another country wanting to deploy that capability early? For example, if countries don't have the capability but participate in common funding for its use, will they then have the certainty that they will be able to use that capability? Uh, it, 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 these kind of issues. You know, defence, as I said at the beginning, is an area where national sovereignty is still key, and you need a lot of political trust before you start merging, you know, tanks and attack helicopters and all these kind of things. So this idea of how we settle the sort of the presumption of availability is key if people are going to invest. Uh, another issue, for example, is, is partners. Uh, do, do these kind of groupings, should we open them up immediately to partners on the basis of the reality that Sweden uh, operated over the skies of Libya, whereas many allies didn't? So Sweden shared more of the burden on that particular case. Uh, I mentioned the 22 in, in Afghanistan. So should we operate on the logic that we'll always be doing operations with partners in the future and therefore fold them into these more traditional NATO collective defense type of arrangements, uh, at least in terms of capability development, right from the very uh, beginning? Uh, of course, uh, it's great uh, to do that, but some allies believe that NATO's defense should rely first and foremost on the allies. Uh, and uh, although partners make extremely valuable contributions, we shouldn't get ourselves into a situation where where we start depending on partners in order to be able to do our mission. So there is a big philosophical debate there that we have to uh, uh, re re resolve. The next thing, of course, is that as NATO sort of goes down uh, with the financial crisis, the amount of multinational capability that you have starts to diminish. You know, the, the command structure is, for those of you who are kind of sentient this, know the command structure has gone from 11 headquarters down to seven, uh, from 13,000 to uh, under 8,000 uh, uh, forces. Uh, and that means to say that you can no longer cover all of your need through the multinational assets that you have at your disposal. In other words, forces permanently assigned to NATO. So you have to basically then go out to the nations and say, look, you know, give me this, give me that. More of a UN type of approach where NATO does the planning but then has to generate all of the forces, many of them, from within nations. So how can we assure that the people in a national headquarters know how to work with NATO? Uh, people in the NATO headquarters know how to work with nations. How can we know what is potentially available uh, out, out there to do our missions? This is going to be a, a major uh, thing uh, for the future. And then finally, of course, we need our nations to be more upfront with us about what they're planning when it comes to defence cuts. They often cut first and inform us later. Uh, and we would like to have a more versatile NATO defence planning process that could essentially you know, find out in advance what nations are planning to do so that we can influence their decisions, or at least the way they go about it, uh, before uh, we are presented with a fait uh, accompli, particularly in trying to make sure that national decisions are geared to NATO priorities. So, yes, uh, it's a no-brainer, ladies and gentlemen. We lack money, and therefore we have to go multinational. Uh, as in ever, every other area of life. But how we do it in practical terms in a way that makes it politically attractive to defence ministers and politically appetising for them is, I think, going to be the, the, the key. The third uh, area uh, which came out of Chicago is partners. We, and of course Ireland, 
uh, here is directly uh, uh, in this perspective. Uh, the, 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 I mentioned the operations, the cruciality of partners. We now have this global network uh, that extends in Central and Eastern Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, Asia. Uh, but many of these partnerships have been based around operations. You know, Australia has never signed an agreement with NATO, at least not until very recently. Uh, it's come in through the operations, through contributing and gradually building up interoperability, intelligence sharing, common doctrine uh, on, on that basis. Uh, what happens after 2014 when everybody goes home and you potentially have, for the first time in NATO's existence, NATO not planning to fight somebody, not in an operation, uh, not preparing for an operation, a sort of NATO at peace. Well, you can laugh at me and say, Jamie, you know, that's not going to happen. There's always an operation. There's always a crisis. Look at Libya. Look at Yugoslavia. Nobody ever predicted these things. And that's true. That's true. That may well be the case. But there is also potentially uh, a scenario where NATO could be not uh, doing an operation for uh, some time to, to come. Uh, and one of the big issues at NATO at the moment is, God, you know, all of this experience that we've gained in Afghanistan painfully, you know, uh, at the cost of blood, as well as treasure, uh, of working together, you know, the way in which the European armies uh, have sort of upgraded their ability to do things like combat through the experience of Afghanistan, working together. You know, a operation is the best exercise that you can conceive of. You know, how are we going to sort of lock in, in the long run, that interoperability, that connectedness? Uh, uh, how are we going to prevent a gradual sort of renationalization of defense so that some countries go off in the direction of expeditionary forces, others go off in the direction of Article 5, collective defense, territorial forces, reserves? And you then, in, in a future sort of situation, have to go back to the drawing board in rebuilding this common doctrine and connectivity. So how can we, therefore, keep partners in, involved. Uh, of course, nobody has the money for major exercises any longer, like we had, you know, Reforgia during the Cold War, 60,000 American troops, 8,000 Canadians coming back to Europe every year. Um, uh, so how can we use sort of technology, you know, computer-assisted training and education? One idea, for example, is the NATO Response Force, to use that more and more for what it was intended to do, to train and, and exercise. And the United States, while announcing that it's removing two combat brigade teams from Europe, uh, also announced that one combat brigade team in Texas will be on station to return to Europe every year to train with the NATO uh, response uh, force. And again, should partners, as part of that interoperability, participate in these type of, 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 of activities? So how do we preserve our partners? Now, looking to the future. I promise to be brief. I haven't, but I'll promise to end briefly. How, wh where are we going? I mean, at the moment in Brussels, there's a, a lot of soul-searching about you know, quo vadis NATO after 2014. The alliance, as I've said, has been in the business of doing operations since the collapse of the Berlin Wall. When one operation has finished, another one has begun. And if you look at NATO today, the result is very much the experience of operations, working with the EU, the UN. This wouldn't have happened. Uh, not in the way it did, had it not been for operations, the pressure on the ground. Uh, the partners, I mentioned that already, working with civilian agencies, the, the new NATO military doctrines, it's all geared on the fact that we do operations. The whole business model, if I can use that term, has been built around that particular uh, 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 paradigm. So there's a bit of soul-searching at the moment. Uh, you know, what will therefore be NATO's function after 2014 if there's no Afghanistan going on to keep us in the media headlines, to you know, give us the resources from governments, uh, uh, to be the central sort of pillar around which NATO folds in all of these other partners. I think, therefore, there, there are sort of three models. And this is barring another Afghanistan coming along. Model number one is, is a return to core business in Europe type model. Uh, let's be frank, there are many allies, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, who would like NATO to return to its sort of core collective defence Article 5 mission. In the new strategic concept, that core central mission of NATO, Article 5 collective defence, was reaffirmed uh, up front. So it's a perfectly legitimate uh, uh, request to make of the alliance. After all, that is what we I exist uh, for. And some allies may feel that, you know, these operations out of theatre 
uh, have left them exposed uh, uh, in, 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 in Europe or, or would like more reassurance. Uh, it's called strategic reassurance. When I work with Madeleine Albright and the group of experts on NATO's new strategic concept, this idea of strategic reassurance, so contingency planning, Article 5 exercises, the NATO response force in a collective defence role, you know, the Baltic air policing, you know, reassurance that NATO still took this seriously. It, it, had become, it hadn't become a paper guarantee. This was really uh, something that was very instrumental uh, in, the, uh, in the debate. So that you can imagine that post-2014, there are some allies who would like NATO to sort of come home, as it were, uh, and refocus on preserving the, the balance of power. What, what, what terminology could we use these days? But at least uh, in, 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 in Europe. Now, again, I understand this desire. Uh, its core business of NATO, and indeed there are there's lots of unfinished legacies of the Cold War that we still need to uh, address. For example, we have tactical nuclear weapons, so does Russia, uh, and we haven't yet succeeded in starting an arms control negotiation uh, to remove those weapons, or at least have more transparency about their their, their potential doctrine, or where they're located, etc. Uh, we have missile defence. You've seen the, the Russian reaction to NATO's initial capability, the, even <laughs> statements about countermeasures uh, involved with putting missiles into Kaliningrad. Again, that shows a, a lack of trust, notwithstanding NATO's desire to work with Russia on missile defence. We've still got exercises where both sides have you know, question marks about each other's military plan and, uh, and exercises. We have a situation where neither NATO nor Russia today uh, are observing the provisions of the CFE treaty vis-a-vis -vis each other, the Treaty on Conventional Forces in, in, in Europe. So there is that kind of legacy which we have to uh, uh, somehow go back to uh, uh, because uh, it hasn't gone away simply because the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. But my own view uh, is that it would not be the best solution 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall for NATO's main uh, uh, sort of raison d'etre to be to maintain the military balance of power in Europe. Uh, we, uh, we do not want to create new dividing lines, quite the opposite. We want a partnership with Russia. We're going to work on that uh, steadfastly. So yes, let's do Article 5 in Europe, but let's not only do collective defence Article 5 in, in Europe. The second paradigm, very briefly, is a kind of you know, NATO that sort of waits for the next operation to come along, uh, and it, which would, in a way, it would be rather like Manchester United, where uh, Alex Ferguson says, look, I'm sorry, boys, but the football season has been cancelled. I'm not sure when the next one's going to come along. But in the meantime, we need to train every day uh, to keep our skills, keep Rooney up front, uh, and to be and to be ready. Uh, and this is often the, you know, NATO. There is a debate here about what is the core NATO. What is the core NATO that we have to keep? Um, the political directors from the NATO defence ministries will be meeting soon to try to define, you know, in an age of austerity, what is the, you know, the, the core that, that, that we must have? You know, is it, uh, do we have to have a cyber defence capability as part of that? Uh, does it mean missile defence? Do we have to have, you know, things like AWACS, uh, air, air, air uh, observation platforms? Uh, you know, what kind of command structures do, do we need? You know, what can we get rid of? Uh, uh, because we can reconstitute it in a crisis. But what do we have to keep a ring fence from cuts so that if a Libya comes along, we can respond in eight days rather than eight weeks? We've got, you know, essential surge capability uh, to build up. You know, what, what is it? What is fundamental? I think that's going to be a difficult debate because some people inevitably will see that only as doing another Afghanistan. You know, the core is an expeditionary mission. Others will interpret it more in, for example, territorial defence. Uh, certain countries of Central and Eastern Europe would like that core capability to reserve the ability to do a multi-joint operation plus, in other words, an Article mm -hmm. 5 contingency type of e exercise. Do, you know, is that something that, that should be a, a priority? Others, like myself, want these core capabilities to include the ability, for example, to monitor... Uh, cyberspace, you know, to do early warning, to do forensics, to continue to build in the NATO computer incident response capability, the rapid response teams, all of the things that we have developed uh, uh, for uh, cyber defence. In other words, to extend collective defence into the area of the new challenges, but looking at resilience, you know, looking at uh, 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 
the uh, the ability to recover quickly from those kind of attacks. So so that's the second model. It's a kind of you know sort of NATO in hibernation but ready to bounce back model. The third model, which is my preference, I have to say, is to continue NATO's post Cold War development even in an age of austerity. In other words, to stay true to the strategic concept, to keep NATO as a comprehensive security organisation and not just a collective defence organisation, to keep it involved in the broad range of security issues and not simply hard-end military <laughs> operations, uh, to continue to interact with partners. Now, what would this mean? Well, uh, first of all, we have to be successful at preserving the global network of partners. Secondly, we have to keep the focus on the emerging security challenges, which are the things that are attacking us every day of the week. 5.5 billion uh, cyber attacks uh, recorded uh, last, last year. Um, it's very easy, of course, for the Allies to be sometimes dubious about NATO's role in dealing with the emerging security challenges. Why? Well, reason number one is many of them are civilian in nature. 95% of cyber is owned and operated by the private sector. There's a, a view that you know, if one ally is attacked, only that ally suffers. You know, it's not like a conventional attack where everybody's affected. You know, an energy cutoff concerns country X. So you know, should solidarity apply where only one country uh, is, is, is affected? Um, number three, you, know, you need to, in developing these kind of strategies to have a very broad multi-stakeholder approach. The UN does it well. The OSCE, where I was at this morning, the Irish Presidency Conference on Cyber, does it well, linking up with the private sector NGOs. NATO still is an organisation largely built around the military core, uh, interacting with foreign and defence ministries. Nothing against those, they're very good, but we don't deal with, you know, intelligence services so much, Department of Homeland Security, Interior Ministry, Police, you know, which is what you, the kind of range you need. So NATO would have to move in these directions to be more effective at dealing with these challenges. But I think above all, the, the major issue is that they don't lend themselves to an all or nothing approach. You know, NATO has been in the situation in the last 20 years where we've either been 100% of the solution of something, well, I'm exaggerating a bit, but a major, major stakeholder, or we've not been involved at all. So Bosnia, who had the biggest responsibility there initially? NATO. Kosovo. Afghanistan. You know, nobody else has 150,000 troops in Afghanistan. So NATO has either owned a problem, more or less, for better or for worse, or it, you know, Iraq, Syria at the moment hasn't been involved at all. So the problem with the new challenges is that you can't be all or nothing. You could be 10% of this, 20% of that. You know, you have to be a team player supporting somebody else. You can't be in the lead all the time. So the organisation has to sort of work out, you know, uh, how it's going to relate to this broader multi-stakeholder community and to be happy, you know, not to be in the lead, uh, but to be, you know, occupying a, a niche. And, and this is a bit of a cultural change for an organisation which is used to leading from the front uh, and taking on the, the major sort of crisis management uh, role. That said, um, I'm a firm believer that this is the only way to go because this is the nature of modern security and the new diplomacy. It is multi-stakeholder. Uh, the, the government's in cyber don't control the domain, they don't control the means of, of, of controlling uh, that uh, 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 domain. The private sector uh, has uh, better threat analysis in many cases. Uh, and, and of course you're dealing with a multitude of different actors whose behaviour you can't influence through traditional diplomacy and who are not going to give up because in the cyber world they're not put off by the cost, there's no cost. They're not put off by geographical obstacles. They don't suffer from exhaustion. You can't tell them when they're losing, as you can a, tradi a traditional state. So these problems are not going to go away. Uh, and for better or for worse, we need to find a way of dealing with them. Next thing, if we're going to continue on the lines of the strategic concept, we have to get NATO more involved in political consultation, intelligence sharing, early warning. We can't always wait for the attack to happen and then figure out how to respond. It's not easy to do prevention. Uh, people talk about it without being able to define it, but we need to think harder about how we can use NATO's political machinery to head off problems. Uh, and then, if I may finally, uh, uh, on this, uh, this note, before I stop, uh, if NATO is not going to be doing operations uh, around the globe after Afghanistan, if, uh, I don't know, but one thing is for certain, others will be. 
Uh, the UN has about 22 different operations out there in the field today. Uh, other organizations, African Union, ECOWAS, Arab League, tentatively, but still uh, other regional organizations are beginning to step up to the, uh, to, to the plate. So somebody will be doing the peacekeeping somewhere. Many of these organizations suffer from problems we've known for a long time, training, equipment, uh, strategic uh, airlift, uh, medi medivac, uh, the, ca the capacity building areas. And NATO, I believe, can use many of its instruments, uh, Allied Command Transformation, Allied Command Operations, the centers of excellence that we've built up for training and education purposes on behalf of others. We haven't done many hybrid missions in the past. Uh, in fact, the first experience we had of working with the UN in, with the dual key in Bosnia was not a happy hybrid experience for us, you remember? Uh, uh, we prefer to do things by ourselves. Uh, but uh, the future, I think, is going to be the hybrid. The EU has done a lot of these things uh, with the UN in, in Zaire, uh, with the African Union in Somalia. Uh, and I think we also are going to have to be more comfortable with the idea that we are sharing an operation uh, with another international organisation, providing backup and support. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, they have the responsibility, African solutions for African problems. They do not want our boots on the ground. But NATO now has, at least in the UN, achieved a sort of legitimacy we didn't have before in terms of the willingness of these organisations to work with us. Look at the Arabs over Libya or the African Union in Darfur or, or Somalia. Uh, and we, sh we should build on this and, and, and increasingly see how we can be a facilitator or trainer for others uh, and, and not only have them uh, sort of following on behind uh, ours. So, so there is a third scenario, which is to keep NATO, as I say, usefully engaged in all these issues, uh, even in an age of austerity. Uh, I know that in this uh, country, Winston Churchill is, is not necessarily a heroic figure for historical reasons, which I truly understand. Uh, but he did, uh, want, when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer, once say that, gentlemen, we've run out of money, and now we must think. And I think this is probably quite a good motto for NATO in the next decade as well. Thank you very much.